Welcome everyone to today's meeting of the East Shrine of Yorkshire Council Strategic Planning Committee. I am Councillor Leo Hammond, Chairman of the Committee and today's meeting. To my right are Planning Officers Stephen Hunt, Anna Weldale and Matthew Sunman and the Highways Officer Andy Forsey. To my left is John Wiley from Democratic Services and the Council Solicitor David Crampton. Also in the Chamber are members of the Committee and members of the public. The arrangements for dealing with planning applications will be as follows. Firstly, an officer's summary and update will be provided. Items involving members of the public will be dealt with first and speakers are restricted to five minutes with a warning when 30 seconds remains. Speakers are not permitted to circulate additional information, including photographs, plans or petitions during today's meeting. Any councillor not on the committee who has also requested to speak on an application will be given five minutes as well. Members of the committee are to note the information provided by officers and speakers. Any decision proposed which is contrary to the recommendation contained within our reports will require reasons if the proposal is to refuse and reasons and conditions if the proposal is to approve the application. In accordance with the Council's equality policy, speakers are asked to refrain from making any comments which could be construed as being discriminatory or defamatory, otherwise I will have to intervene. Additionally, I would request that although differing views may be expressed today, that we all respect each other and each other's views. Please ensure mobile phones are switched on to silent to avoid any disruption to today's meeting. And also, whether in the chamber or on Zoom, please ensure you are on mute when you are not speaking to also avoid any disruptions to the meeting. The fire procedure is as follows. If the fire alarm sounds, attendees will be directed where to go, please follow instructions from officers. We'll now move on to our agenda for today. The first item is declarations of pecuniary, non-pecuniary and prejudicial interests and declarations under Section 4 of the Code of Conduct for dealing with, for dealing with planning applications. Members to uh, declare any interests on today's agenda. Do members have any interests you would like to declare? Councillor Rudd. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, item 5 of page 14. I've had correspondence from the applicant. Thank you, Councillor Rudd. Any other members wish to declare any interest? Councillor Wilkinson. Um, item five, I was at two parish councils where it was discussed. I made no comments knowing that I may be <laughs> sat on this committee. Councillor Matheson. Thank you. Um, item six, uh, I wasn't able to attend the, the organised site visit, so I made a personal site visit on Monday. I didn't see anyone and I didn't speak to anyone there. Thank you. Any other declarations of interest? Councillor Davison. Do we need to declare that we've been on a site visit this morning? I mean, if, if members would like to, all of us who went on the site visit this morning, please raise your hand just to declare that to make sure everyone is aware. Any other declarations of interest? No, just from me then, on top of that site visit for item six, uh, on item five, I too have attended Government and Parish Council and Marky Wheaton Town Council when this application was discussed by those bodies. However, I did not pass comment on my view on the applications. And I believe uh, quite some considerable time ago, I attended a meeting where ward members of affected areas were invited to attend, put on by the applicant just to provide information on what their proposals were. Again, I didn't pass any comment on the application. The item two on the agenda is to approve as a correct record the minutes of the committee meeting held on the 2nd of February 2023, which is pages one to five of our packs. Are members happy with those minutes? Councillor Matheson, would you like to propose them? And Councillor Whittle seconds. All those in favour of approving those minutes? It's carried unanimously. Item three is to receive the minutes of the undermentioned subcommittees. Firstly, Eastern Area Planning of the 13th of February 2023, pages 6 to 10 of our PACs. Are members happy with those minutes? Councillor Healy proposing, and Councillor Davison seconds. All those in favour of adopting those minutes? That's carried as well. And then secondly, Western Area Planning of the 14th of February 2023, pages 11 to 13 of our PACs. Councillor Coulter, she proposing those minutes? Councillor West seconds. All those in favour of approving those minutes? They too have been approved. Item four, do we have any withdrawals? There are no withdrawals, Chair. Thank you. We'll now move on to our applications for today. The first item is item five on the agenda, 
which is pages 14 to 83 of our PAX cross country cable route from Drax Power Station to Fraysfork. Could we have the officer update, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to remind members that this proposal is, is basically for an underground cable with associated access and temporary construction compounds from Fraysthorpe across the East Riding in a southwesterly direction to just south of Barnby on the Marsh. It's part of a wider project that includes development outside of the East Riding, um, it, which is basically a short length of cable and substation within Selby that will be considered under a separate planning application by Selby District Council, an offshore cable to Peterhead in Scotland offshore that will be controlled by the Marine Management Organisation. If approved, um, the proposal will assist the distribution of electricity between Scotland and England. Um, currently, there's more electricity being generated in Scotland that outstrips demand in England. Um, but if this changes, the cable will allow distribution of electricity from England back to Scotland. Since the committee report was issued, there's been one additional objection by the occupiers of Forth Farm at Grandsmoor. Uh, this has increased the total number of objections to 27 in total. The grounds of objection are already covered and assessed in the planning committee report. That's it, Chair. Thank you. We'll now move on to our speakers for this application. We have two speakers. Firstly is a Miss Staples, who is an objector, and I believe is joining us via Zoom. Miss Staples, can you hear us? I think you're on mute. I think you're still on mute. Can we send send a message to Miss Staples? There we go. Ah, Miss Staples, Telling can me you I'm hear us? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? We can everyone hear that fine. Yeah, we can. Oh, Councillor Rood, can you hear? Can yeah, we can we can hear you. Um, Miss Staples, you have I, I five minutes to address. You have five minutes to address the committee with your views and Mr Wiley here will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains. Your time will start when you start speaking. Okay, good afternoon committee. I'm Louise Staples representing NFU members and the land interest group referred to as LIG and we are representing 116 landowners and tenants affected directly by the proposed scheme. We'd like to clarify that we do understand the planning permission will go with the land but no land and landowner will benefit from the permission should it be granted as stated at on page 55 of the committee report at 7.158. The underground cables will take electric from landfall to Drax and there will be no connection which will benefit a landowner directly along the route. Further, the easement across the cables will have restrictions in place as to what a landowner can and cannot do over the cables and so it could be said that this will devalue the land along the route. The NFU and LIG in principle support this scheme but there are construction concerns because this planning application has not been given the detailed scrutiny that would have if it had been submitted under a DCO, a development consent order, where the process is examined in public and reported to the Secretary of State. The concerns which we would ask members to take into account when considering this application are as follows. Planning rights in perpetuity, cable depth, soil and feed drainage reinstatement, the role of the ALO, water supplies, irrigation, access routes, decommissioning, and as-built plans. We would like to see planning conditions set so that there is not a detrimental effect to the agricultural land directly affected. Uh, rights. We would like the rights under the planning permission to be restricted to 99 years and not given in perpetuity. This is to be a recommendation taken forward. The NFU and LIG see no reason for National Grid to have these rights in perpetuity. We expect that electric may not be transmitted along cables in another 100 years' time. Similar underground cable schemes have agreed rights for 99 years. Cable depth. We have been requesting that cables should be laid at a depth of 1.2 metres to the top of the tile and not 900 mils, as is shown in the diagram in the report at page 69, to make sure that once the cables are operational, there will be no interference with day-to-day -day agricultural operations or field drainage. This depth has now been agreed on six other DCO schemes with underground cables. The depth can be shallower if there are exceptional engineering reasons. Access routes. It's stated in the report that the development should be permitted in accordance with plans highlighted at point two, page 56 of the report. 
The landowners had no previous knowledge of these access routes and now different access routes have been agreed or are to be agreed in a variety of locations. We would like to see the new proposed routes to be approved and new plans submitted so that its new access routes are safeguarded. Reinstatement of soils. It has been stated at point six under recommendations on page 59 that no phase of the development should be brought into use until the approved scheme of remediation has been completed. The soil management plan is stated under point nine, page 60, and a restoration scheme at point 13 on page 61. These schemes and plans are essential. NFU and LIG understand how important it is to get specific wording agreed now, which could be set out in the outline KEMP or the outline soil management plan to make sure that certain practices and the correct aftercare is carried out. This is vital to make sure that soil can be reinstated to its pre-construction condition as quickly as possible so that it can come back into agricultural operation. Wording that we would like to see was submitted to National Grid on the 14th of October 2022 in a document headed construction best practice and we would like to see the wording agreed as a planning condition within the outline Kemp. This wording has been agreed on other schemes where a planning application was made, including the Carlisle Link Road and more recently the Anglin Water on the Spa project. The planning approval was delayed for this scheme until this document was agreed. Drainage. It stated at point 10, page 61, that no development should take place until a construction drainage scheme has been submitted to meet policy ENV6. Agricultural field drainage has not been mentioned. From experience, the NFU and LIG know that details of how field drainage will be reinstated and designed must be agreed and set out. The wording we would like included is also set out in the construction best practice document. Again, we would like to see this wording included within the outline Kemp. Reinstatement of field drainage is essential so that land can be restored to its pre-construction condition and to stop any wet areas or flooding of land. Agricultural Liaison Officer. An ALO is mentioned in the outline Kemp at 18.3.15. But this does not set out clearly the roles that are to be carried out by an ALO. So again, we'd like that wording to be agreed and it's in the construction best practice document. Decommissioning. Wording under this section needs to include that any infrastructure apparatus is removed to a depth of 800 mil below the ground level so that future agricultural operations are not affected. Conclusion. So to conclude, the NFU and LIG would like wording from the construction best practice document to be agreed and all other Thank you, Ms. Staples. That is your time. Thank you. Our second speaker on this application is a Mr. Stoko, who is the representative of the applicant. Mr. Stoko, if you'd like to come to the speaker's chair as you're joining us in the chamber. If you'd like to take a seat. You two will have five minutes to address the committee with your views and we'll be provided a 30 second warning when that time remains. If you press the button in front of you, that should turn on your microphone and your time will start when you start speaking. Okay, um, thanks Chair. Uh, good afternoon committee. Um, Sean Stokoe, Planning Manager for National Grid, covering its East Coast offshore projects. Uh, the planning application under consideration today comprises one part, albeit a significant part of a much larger project entitled Siegel 2. The purpose of that project is to reinforce the electricity network between Scotland and England. It comprises 500 kilometers of subsea and underground cables between converter stations in Peterhead, Aberdeenshire, and Drax in North Yorkshire. National Grid is promoting the English components of Siegel 2, including this planning application and a separate planning application to Selby District Council for the onward cabling and converter station. National Grid has also submitted a marine license application to the MMO in respect of the subsea cables. The development subject to the planning application is nationally significant, but it does not meet the criteria or thresholds to be consented as a DCO under the Planning Act. The UK and Scottish governments have set legally binding targets to achieve net zero by 2050 and 2045, respectively. To meet these targets, the UK will need to move towards cleaner, greener, renewable and low carbon energy forms. The UK government in its 10 point plan for green industrial revolution fully recognizes that to connect such energy sources, the UK must undertake a significant reinforcement of its existing electricity transmission network. The requirement has been reinforced by the UK government's British energy security strategy, um, which sets out the government's strategy for achieving energy security and energy independence. The primary objective of this project is to reinforce the electricity network and increase transmission network capability 
between Scotland and the north of England by 2029. Seagull 2 will enable the transportation of up to two gigawatts of electricity, enough to power up to two million homes in the UK. This will facilitate the government's targets of 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, enough to, po enough to power every single home in the country. Seagull 2 needs to be operational by 2029 to meet this target. The East, within East Riding, Seagull 2 comprises 67 kilometres of underground cable from where it comes ashore at Fraysthorpe to where it crosses the River Ouse. The cable will be installed within a working width, typically 40 metres wide, comprising a haul road, a cable trench and soil storage. The cable will be buried for its entire length. The exact method of burial will depend on the final design following the appointment of contractors. Construction methods comprise open cut methods in agricultural land and trenchless methods where crossing features or obstacles such as roads and water courses need to be negotiated. Construction of the project is expected to take five years. And again, the objective is Seagull 2 to be operational by 2029. National Grid continues to engage with affected parties, including landowners, and are currently engaged in detailed discussions with the NFU and with landowners. In fact, only as recently as the 7th of February, we had a landowner um, drop-in centre at Driffield Rugby Club, which was exceptionally well attended. National Grid is fully aware that land agents and the NFU have raised a number of objections, but these can be dealt with through land agreements. Those matters relate to cable burial depth, where National Grid has followed industry guidance, but at the same time, National Grid is accepting of a greater burial depth along more than 80% of the cable route, where this will ensure protection of the cable with full respect to existing agricultural practices. Access, where National Grid is seeking to balance disturbance with ensuring we can undertake the works as efficiently and as quickly as possible. Soil management, where National Grid have included an outline and detailed soil management plan, which is based on industry best practice, and land drainage, where National Grid have appointed local specialist drainage consultants to provide best technical support. National Grid will require land rights, but this is a separate consideration to the planning application. National Grid's objective is to reach voluntary agreements with all landowners, but it will seek compulsory purchase as a fallback or last resort. 30 seconds left. To summarise, National Grid is under a statutory duty under the Electricity Act to bring forward efficient, coordinated and economical development proposals. National Grid has balanced that statutory duty with significant engagement that has been undertaken with landowners and other stakeholders in developing these project proposals. The planning application is in accordance with the development plan and should be approved accordingly. There is an urgent national need for this type of project type. Thank you. That is your time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. If you could turn your speaker off and feel free to return to the audience or you can sit there and watch us closer up if you want to. Um, that's all our speakers on this application. So I'll now open it to members for debate. And I have Councillor Whittle wishing to speak first. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I certainly appreciate and understand the requirement for this project. And I think it can only be regarded as being a good... What are you doing to me? It's only... It's usually Councilor McMass that does that sort of thing. Uh, we, we, I do recognise the need for this uh, project, and I think it's uh, overall a very good thing. One thing which did strike me, which has been highlighted by both speakers uh, today, uh, regards the depth of the cables. I think we should all be agreed that... Um, in actual fact, it would be safer, not just 80%, it would be 1.2 uh, metres throughout the project. Uh, that's to avoid any problems with farming implements. Let's face it, as years go by, farming implements may become more um, deeper, they may become uh, more, um, as it were, uh, up to date, and as such, uh, more easily uh, damaged by either contact with cables or indeed damage the cables themselves. So I think it would be safe, Chair, uh, uh, to ask that uh, we look at 1.2 metres uh, rather than 0.9. Uh, that being considered, Chair, I would be quite happy to propose acceptance of this uh, application. Thank you. Thank you. Just can we get clarity from 
offices as to whether we can condition 1.2 metres rather than 0.9. It's a, it's a bit unreasonable to condition the depth, Chair, because there'll be some instances where the depth can be high, um, 0.9, for example, under roads, it wouldn't necessarily have to be at 1.2 metres. Um, and there are other infrastructure um, along the route. So what will happen is, um, as land agreements go forward, um, that will be agreed with the farmers um, and landowners going forward. So if it needs to be a greater depth than 0.9 metres, they will be secure at that point. Are you satisfied with that, Councillor Whistle? Uh, I can appreciate that uh, we can't go down too deep under roads and the like. So long as it's at a, a reasonable depth below farmland, I'll be happy with it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I've got Councillor Coultish wishing to speak now. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I appreciate in the report um, that it sets out um, a biodiversity enhancement plan uh, or replacement, should I say, uh, and that it, it states that it's, it, it won't be able to biodiversity that the applicant will replace won't be on site. Um, so I just seek clarity from officers why it can't be on site and, and clarity on whether the off-site uh, biodiversity enhancement will be within the East Trident and not just anywhere in the UK. Mr Sullivan, can you clarify? Yeah, uh, thank you, yeah, Councillor. Yes, it would be within the East Riding. Um, the reason that they can't provide it on site is because most of the land is, is operational agricultural land, so they're growing vegetable, growing crops and things on there, so you can't put the biodiversity enhancements on there. Um, it is secured by Condition 4 um, for the Biodiversity Net Gain Plan and uh, National Grid have committed to a 10% Biodiversity Net Gain as part of the development. So that will be secured. Um, obviously, at this stage, it's, it's, not, it's not as easy to, to say where it's going to go, so, but that will come forward and be secured through Condition. And it will be on a piece of land in the East Riding? Yes, it will be within the East Riding, yeah. Is that happy with that, Councillor Coulsish? Uh, Councillor Rudd. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I notice, uh, first of all, that uh, many of the um, parish councils uh, and town councils are, are in favour of this application. And some of the uh, issues that have been brought up by uh, other bodies can be, and I understand, are being discussed with the applicants. Um, so I'm sure that there will be agreement uh, eventually on, uh, on, 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 on the issues that they're concerned with. Um, it, it obviously is, is very necessary, is this. I think we've got to remember that uh, once this cable is, is constructed, um, it will be, um, be covered up, back to soil as it were, and uh, the farmers can uh, get on with planting their crops as they do very efficiently and well. Uh, in the East Riding. Uh, so I, I I cannot see, although I understand there's 27 objections, uh, that, uh, that, that, that really uh, there are any, there is any significance in some of these objections, although they've all got to be looked at, of course. Um, but I, I'm sure overall that this can only be a benefit to the, to the whole country. Uh, and certainly in, 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 in the area that it's being uh, constructed from Drax uh, to the first well, coastline, of course, as far as we are concerned in the East Riding, um, and of course, eventually up to Scotland. So I'm quite happy to second the proposal from Council Whittle, and uh, I'm sure you, you know the depth of the cable and so on will be um, negotiated wherever it's. Uh, it's applicable, and I think, as, as, as uh, I believe the planning officer has indicated, uh, you, you know, it, that there are times when the depth might be um, uh, uh, more in some areas than in others, but I'm sure it will be all for, for uh, safely done and for the benefit of, of, of the farmers as well there. So very happy to second this, and it's, uh, it's, it's very much needed, and I'm sure it will be very successful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rudd. Councillor Healy, you wish to come in? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions, first of all, for officers. What's the, the, the generation source of this? Uh, I, I'm just to understand a little bit more. Um, it talked about converter stations and the National Grid um, manager spoke about converter stations at Fraysthorpe and at Peterhead. 
Is this onshore energy? What sort of power stations generating it? Is it is it offshore? Can can you just explain a little bit about the nature of the energy that's being generated? First of all, Mr. yes, it, it, it's from numerous sources, but it'd be mainly the offshore wind turbines from Scotland. But it, it's it's energy that's that's going onto the grid, so it could be from from any source, but it'd be mainly from offshore wind. And is there a requirement for Drax also to generate? We talked about vice versa. So most of it's going from Scotland to England. Are we assuming that Drax can then generate electricity and send it the other way? Yes, but within the trench, there are two cables. So you can send power electricity both ways. So Scotland could send the energy to electricity to England and we can send it up to Scotland. And the, and the electricity that we send to Scotland, will that be generated at Drax? It would, or it would it just be on, it would just from the grid. So it could be from any source. It could be from any source. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I support the comments that have been uh, made here. I mean, clearly this is a major national infrastructure project and National Grid does have a statutory duty. Um, to facilitate that. And it's all part of the government's green energy target. We heard there that uh, this is capable of two gigawatts of electricity generation. I think the um, comments from NFU, obviously there were some uh, concerns around cable burial depth that we've discussed, access, soil management and land drainage. All of these, it's impossible for us to have any input into, I think. Um, but should, are subject to voluntary agreements. Um, I think that with its statutory obligations, National Grid is um, cognizant of the importance of entering into agreements um, and will do its best to achieve good outcomes from those agreements. Um, and I'm sure it has a, a record of doing that and, and having agreements with, with local communities and local landowners. Um, I think Siegel 2 is critical, obviously, for uh, the future um, arrival eventually at uh, net zero. Um, so with all that in mind, yes, I'll be supporting this application as well. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Healy. Councillor McMaster. Thank you, Chair. I had two questions. Um, both have been satisfactorily um, answered, asked and answered. So I have nothing further to add. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, again, some of the questions that I had have already been asked and answered. Um, one point, if, if, if I may um, add, uh, I, I was listening very carefully to the NFU's point of view um, with regard to um, condition number nine, um, subparagraph four, which is the sole management plan. Um, and I, I fully understand that, that the officers will be getting that sole management plan and will be um, identifying whether it's it's correct or not. But I, I think in line with what um, Councillor Healy was mentioning, one of the areas there that concerns me having land myself is the, the, the field drainage requ requirements and the fact that... Um, once this goes through, it's going to damage all their field drainage at the point that it's going through. And will this soil management plan therefore uh, guarantee that it will be uh, replaced as it was originally um, and, and, and that, the, that the field drainage will be replaced properly uh, in line with what they need? And secondly, is clearly um, that um, topsoil is a, a very a big issue within the country and that this topsoil will be managed properly and, and, and kept so that it can be replaced uh, properly. That's that's my first question, so I may as well discuss that. Mr. Sumlin, can you answer those? Uh, yes, that it will be protected and it will be made sure that the soil, in accordance with that condition, that it is managed correctly and, and is reinstated to, to the same quality. Excellent. It, it, it's just obviously it's difficult because it just says that you, we will do a, a plan. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Thank you very what much. What about the drainage question that Council Wilkinson asked? You, did you not mention? Yeah, that, that will be that were picked up as, as part of that. Yeah. Um, second one, maybe more difficult for you, given the fact of the length of this cable. Um, but, uh, but do you have any idea of what the, the, the closest um, home to the cable is within our parameters? I, forgive me for kind of forgive me for give, give catching someone you. a minute to find uh, it in yeah. the uh, in the plans. I, I couldn't can't see it, but um, I, it might be somewhere within there.
I don't think that that's been specified in the report, but it has been carefully looked at by public protection. They've looked at all of the supporting documentation um, and they haven't objected to the proposal. Um, obviously, you know, we, we do have conditions at the back that will protect the immunity, for example, uh, hours of um, operation um, conditioned. Um, On page 48, it says 7.99, there are a number of isolated dwellings and settlements within 500 metres of the proposed development. Yes, so I mean, conditions like condition 19, that specifies like the timings, for example, so that, that will ensure that those residents are safeguarded during the construction of the development. I, I think what, what I was looking for is that I appreciate that somewhere within the report, and again, forgive me, I can't remember which exact one it was, it said that we're, it's not applying um, uh, system to actually look at whether or not there is a problem with um, such as electricity stroke, um, in, induction magnetic fields. But with all due respect, uh, you know, if you had a 525,000 volt cable next to you, which is producing an enormous um, magnetic field, um, 1.2 metres of soil ain't going to make a big difference if you sat on top of it. Um, and, you know, we all know that there are health problems that's why we don't have overhead cables over allowed over um residential um properties now so my point was it, it, is there anything within a 400 meter zone which would might cause problems due to induction this has been locked into by our protection team and they they don't have any concerns thank you that's all i needed for was that um and, and and finally um one of the areas that the nfu did come up with and it was quite interesting don't know why i found it interesting but i did um is whether or not we have this in perpetuity or a 99 year um uh, agreement now when we're dealing with wind farms we have a 50 year one and uh, yet yeah, we have here uh, one that's in perpetuity i appreciate it's a national infrastructure and i appreciate it's buried but just a they ask the question, so I will just ask a question as well, just to see whether you yeah. can answer that for me. Usually with above ground infrastructure, there's a reason for removing it from a visual amenity point of view. So, for example, a wind turbine, we would put an end date and then they're after not used, that they're taken down and land reinstated. Here, the cable will be laid and then reinstated with through condition. Um, usually with underground infrastructure, it's not unusual for it just to be left in ground because you've got to then disturb the ground that's been reinstated to get the cable out. So at the end of the 99 years, you just end up leaving the cable there. And it doesn't really seem a reason to put an end date on, in this case. Fine. Thank you. That answers all the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, Councillor West, you're next on the list. Thank you. Just uh, in reference to Historic England's comments on page 29 and the second paragraph on page 30, where it talks about the uh, relationship with the East Riding's archaeological creators, curators, sorry, and conservation staff. It sort of seems to be alluding to um, confidence that our staff at the East Riding will have um, control over any fines before or after. Um, do we have confident, confidence in the um, conditions that we have on page 59, number seven? which refers to the archaeological finds, and that I think basically trying to say that they wouldn't want the um, applicant to ride roughshod over anything. And yes, I think there was a bit of confusion and more about an officer's um, feel, own feelings rather than the procedure that you go through about um, the archaeology from in larger infrastructure, really, and obviously that will be looked at through other means. Um, the condition that's that's been put at number seven is actually the details that has come from our archaeologists. So um, that, that will make sure any archaeological finds are, are safeguarded and, and assessed as necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor West, for raising that. Uh, Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Chairman. Just uh, picking up on the comments from, uh, from others um, regarding soil quality and reinstatement and the drainage of land. I'm just wondering, is there any scope um, within this, that rather than reinstating to exactly the same position that a, a piece of land has been in, uh, to actually allow for improvement with the applicant negotiating with the landowner. Because if you're going across a soggy field that's pretty poor, you don't want to be um, reinstating back to that poor quality. It's an opportunity to increase the, the quality of the land. 
Um, I'm wondering if maybe we could put that in as um, as an advisory, even if it can't be con put into the conditions of anything else. Mr. Summon, could that be an informative if members would like it to be? We can put it on as an informative, yes. And there is there is a, a reinstatement uh, condition on there as well. So we, we could definitely put that as an informative. Uh, Councillor Whittle and Councillor Rudd, as the proposed and seconder, are you happy to include that informative in your motion? I'm seeing nods from both of you, so we'll add that into your, your motion for approval. Finally, on my list, I have Councillor Davison wishing to speak. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I, I have great support for the NFU comments. Um, and um, it's not just the cable depth, which I think the trench depth which I think is important, but there were other items which um, we were perhaps a bit unable to catch all of the items that were mentioned. But in the report on page 35, uh, the NFU's comments are, are listed there. The cable depth of 0.9 metres is a concern. Cables must be at the depth of at least 1.2 metres to ensure sufficient distance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is it possible that, um, and has it been conditioned that, um, that there is a, a stipulated minimum depth? Is it conditioned anywhere in our approval? And Mr. Sumner? We haven't conditioned the depth, but obviously that's what's come forward as part of the application. And if they go higher than that, then that's when they're going to cause problems with coming mm. into touch with you know, family machinery and practices. So they were forever amending the cable, so there's no there were, there were no benefit in in going you know any higher than 0.9 meters. That's the general start, uh, practice, uh, get the, the you know standard practice, but that they have to work towards. Um, and like they've made it clear on, on numerous occasions, they will work with landowners, and where it needs to be deeper than 0.9 meters, then they will do that. I just think that NFU are saying 1.2 um, is a better standard above which they can go. Um, and even, even in, on page uh, 39, a rather ambiguous, um, I thought it was ambiguous comment, the cable depth of 0.9 metres is a minimum depth. And then it says, where necessary, the depth of the cable will be lower and can be lowered on land, blah, blah. I mean, that is ambiguous, saying the depth will be lower that means to me that's 0.5 metres. That's lower than 0.9 metres. I know it's deeper. <laughs> I know what they're trying to say is that the, the depth should be deeper, not lower. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I just feel that um, it, it's confusing. I think the whole um, uh, consultation with the NFU has been pretty, pretty unacceptable as far as the NFU are concerned. Even if you're only in Spaldington, um, where uh, where it was. clearly they had a bit of a punch up in Spaldington, I think with the with the representatives. But um, I, I would be disappointed if we couldn't set um, at least a minimum depth of 0.9 in in as a condition. So you want do you want a condition as a minimum depth of 9.9? <clears throat> okay, 0.9 meters. Yeah. Nine meters. Okay, and that then allows where um, possible for them to go deeper. Yeah. Again, councillors Whittle and Rudd as a proposed and second, are you happy to add that to your original uh, motion for approval? I've seen Councillor Matheson, your hand suddenly shot up. I'll come back to Councillor Wilson after Councillor Matheson. Yes, um, Chairman, I, I have concerns in that there might be instances where to go lower than half a metre might actually cause damage to something, even if it's only for a foot distance of going somewhere. So I think that variability across the route of the, the cable, I think is important to leave on a site by site basis rather than having a standard across the entire route. I'm thinking of archeology span and such that we could be plowing straight through something that's, that we find is important in order to meet the planning condition. Councillor Wilkinson, were you going to make a similar comment? Um, uh 
similar but not exactly the same. I was concerned exactly what Mr. Summon had actually mentioned, that there will be times when it's going under a road or going on something like that, and they don't need point anything more than 0.9, in fact, less than 0.9. And um, I, I, so I'm concerned that we, we're not too prescriptive, uh, that, you know, and I, I understand that it's important that we look after them. But um, I, personally, I feel that this is already good enough for us and that it, it, it says... I mean, the gentleman from the uh, looking at the application, uh, the manager there was saying that eighty percent of this is going to be um, lower than that, um, and deeper than that, if one wants to use the terms rather than lower. <laughs> um, so I'm 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 concerned that we've been a little too prescriptive with that. That's all. I'm just real. I mean, obviously, it's, it's up to members what you what you want to do. You can either have that condition or, or choose not to. Councillor Rudd, did you want to come in? Please, Chairman, I, I think really we've got to allow some flexibility. There's got to be the flexibility there. I think uh, I think to put an actual uh, figure on it would be would be wrong, and the flexibility will be determined by the experts who would get it. Quite frankly, so. So, Councillor Davison, would you still like to propose that condition, or are you satisfied not to? Put, could you put your microphone on, please? Yes, I would like to uh, propose a 0.9 minimum. I would have liked to have proposed a 1.2 minimum, uh, but, you know, that probably wouldn't be acceptable. But I think a 0.9 um, metre minimum is the minimum we should require. Thank you. So just to clarify then, Councillor Whittle, as the proposer of the original motion, are you happy to accept that condition or not? Uh, no. No, and Councillor Rudd, I take it you're not happy to either. In which case, would you like to make a, an amendment to the motion, Councillor Davison, to include that condition? Could you put your microphone on, please? Yes, I would. Right. Yes, yes, I would. So, and then is there anyone who would like to second that amendment to the motion? Councillor Healy. Thank you. Does any of them, do any of the members wish to speak? Councillor McMaster. Yeah, Chair, thank you. I'm, I'm no expert in this and I'm inclined to say, I'll leave this to the experts. We might be imposing something that may well be detrimental in certain areas just purely because we listening to somebody's reservations and we don't actually know what the consequences are of going deeper in certain areas where we may impede or damage something else. I tend to agree with Councillor Matheson. We've exercised our, we, we've emphasised our reservations about the distances and I think we just need to leave it to the professionals. They will not do something that is not safe or acceptable and I think we should leave it up to the professionals to decide on the different distances, depths. Thank you, Councillor Master Councillor Healy, which is coming. Yeah, um, as it says in the report, uh, 7.24, cable depth of 0.9 is a minimum depth and industry standard. So what, what was, was being suggested here is that, that 0.9 is the minimum. In fact, in fact, if they decided to go higher than that or shallower than that, then they would be contravening industry standards so so actually all that we're saying in 0.9 is do it safely and if they came above 0.9 they wouldn't be doing it safely in fact they'd be doing it they'd be they, they wouldn't be doing best practice they wouldn't be following industry standard so don't think the 0.9 thing actually restricts them in any way uh, that's the minimum they were going to do that anyway but it's just a sort of uh uh, extra extra break, extra condition to say, for goodness sake, whatever you do, don't um, depart from industry standards. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Can I just bring in Mr Summon just to clarify exactly whether it's actually already in the application a minimum depth of 0.9 metres or whether a separate condition would be required if that's what members want to have? If, if members want to put the condition on the account, I mean, it's showing on the plans that, you know, it would be a, a minimum of, of 0.9 uh, nine meters but it is self-regulated you know you quite you pick that up it's already been it's already covered by the legislation and that's the industry guidance but there may be instances however where the cable needs to be buried from the surface underground so you know it, it might be a little bit higher 
when necessary, but it's, it's covered already by the legislation and really we would need that the planning system should let that system um, do its thing. We don't need to, to beef it up again by covering it under the planning condition, but if members want to do that, then that's up to yourselves. I think obviously it's up to members of the committee to decide whether you want that condition added or if you're satisfied that the uh, industry requirements will will deal with that issue or not. Um, for me, I think the main there's there's a few objections in here which are still outstanding. There's the Yorkshire War, uh, Yorkshire Wildlife Trust concern about not having on-site biodiversity enhancement and mitigation. But I think Councillor Coulter's question adequately addressed that, uh, and I'm satisfied that, especially with the ten percent increase net gain on biodiversity uh, from from the applicant, we will have a good off-site contribution towards mitigating and improving uh, any loss in, in the East Riding's biodiversity level. And also I noticed there's concerns from um, the local gas network about potential effects on their infrastructure, but similar to the concerns from the landowners, that's really a civil matter which is out of this committee's control and is not a material planning consideration. I do note with interest after the comments of, of, of the NFU uh, representative that there's 116 landowners involved with this and only 27 have actually objected. So that's that's an interesting thing to bear in mind, although, of course, it's not actually part of the application before us today. I'm, I'm quite satisfied that this is a, a good application. I think, obviously, that we there's, there is the national benefit that we can all see, and I believe that the in industry standards, which I have no doubt that national grid will follow, uh, satisfy this concern about um, the depth of the, of the proposed cable. So we have... Two, well, we have an emotion on the table for approval in line of officers' recommendations, plus an informative from councillors Whittle and Rudd. But then we also have, now have the amendment, which is adding that additional condition to enforce the 0.9 metre minimum depth as part of the planning process put forward by councillors Davison and Healy. So we'll take the vote on the amendment first. All those members in favour of the amendment, please raise your hand. That's two members. All those against? Chairman. Any abstentions? No. The amendment therefore falls and we go back to the original motion put forward by councillors Whistle and Rudd, which is to approve the application in line with the recommendations in our report with the additional informative, which could you just remind me what the informative is, Mr Wiley? I've forgotten. Yes, Chairman, it's, it was in, uh, in instances of reinstatement whereby... Yes, to improve drainage where possible as part of... To make an improvement the reinstatement. The reinstatement work. Yes. So, members who are in favour of that motion, please raise your hand. That's everyone, Chairman. That's carried unanimously. So, the application is therefore approved subject to those conditions and informatives. Thank you, members, for the detailed debate on that item. We will now move on to our second application for today, which is item six, land south of High Farm, Main Road, Ralph, pages 84, to 118 of our packs. Can I have the officers update, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. I've just popped a plan on the screen. Um, so this application is for the change of use of land for the siting of 71 caravans with associated access, on-site roads, drainage and infrastructure as an extension to the existing car caravan and tourism park at High Farm, Ralph. An updated proposed site plan has been received, um, and I'll just pop that on the screen, showing a detailed landscaping scheme with additional planting, increasing the buffer directly behind the closest neighbouring properties and adding more evergreen and mature tree planting. This plan is considered to be acceptable by, by officers. In summary, the plan provides increased semi-mature evergreen planting and semi-mature deciduous of both standard and heavy standard size, which can be planted at 4.2 to 4.5 metres in height. The dog walking area that was originally around the edge of the site has been removed and the 2.5 clear deep, deep dog walk area has been replaced with spiky shrub planting to create a further barrier and landscaping buffer. The existing yeah. edge is 1.2 to 1.5 metres high and this has be, will be maintained at a height of four metres, which is to be secured by condition. Sections showing the proposed immediate landscaping and established landscaping scheme have been submitted. As a result of the additional plan, 
an, an update is required to conditions 2, 6, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 and 18 to refer to the updated plan number. Condition four, four, sorry, 14 should also be updated to say following the first caravan being brought onto the site rather than following first occupation or completion, just to make sure the landscaping is started a little bit earlier in the process. And condition 15 also needs to be updated to refer to a minimum height of landscaping of four metres rather than two metres. So that's been doubled. In addition, since the publication of the report, 10 letters of support have been received from local residents and businesses raising the following points. The proposal will boost the local visitor and tourism economy. The proposal will support other local businesses which currently support and supply the park, as well as other local businesses such as the local pub. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to speakers for this application. We have two speakers for this application. The first is a Mr Higby, who I believe is joining us in the room. Mr Higby, who is an objector, you have five minutes to address the committee with your views. Mr Wiley here will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains and your time starts when you start speaking. OK, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to talk. Um, some of the points that um, I'm bringing up, you have actually uh, mentioned in your last slide, but uh, I think it is just worth going over those. High Farm Holiday Park is advertised as being a five-star park nestled in 130 acres of tranquil land, but it isn't with a forthcoming proposal. The land wanting to be developed is the last green field on site, um, apart from the mature golf uh, course. When the County Council first passed High Farm Country Park development for Pat Northgrave, the front two fields were turned down on the basis of being left to agricultural use. Hence the golf course is where it is now and not on the proposed field for the 71 caravans now being looked at. Um, <clears throat> one of uh, the front fields has already been developed for, for uh, caravan tourers. So what has changed from the original decision not to uh, develop all those years ago? My main concerns are my cottage um, soak away for septic tank is in the proposed development field, but now trees have been planted over it. What damage is that going to do? Um, I've already had to uh, empty the septic tank recently because the land is not being disturbed anymore and um, sewage is not running away. Um, we've had the incidents of um, raw sewage lying on top of the grass field. A wire fence has been put along the boundary of my property, creating a pathway where residents and visitors to the site walk along, causing my dogs, who are in, in outside kennels, to constantly bark. Residents stop to talk to the animals, and on occasions I've seen them actually teasing them, causing unnecessary noise to myself and um, family. I work nights and we have to take the dogs to um, my uh, father-in-law's farm um, so that I can actually get some sleep. The field floods, so where will the water go now? Light pollution from the proposed site. Noise pollution already a problem from the existing caravan site. Um, particularly in summer, a lot of noise comes over and that noise can go into the early hours of the morning. Impact on the environment, existing wildlife. Um, that backfield has had um, a lot of bird life on it, particularly waders, amphibians, mammals, and so on. Existing shelter belt does not shield the proposed site, as, as stated in the report. Thank you. That's all I've got to say. Thank you, Mr Higby. Uh, our second speaker is a Miss Edwardson, who is the applicant's agent and also join us in the room. Ms. Edwardson, you have five minutes to address the committee with your views, and Mr. Wiley will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains. Time starts when you start speaking. Chair members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you to those members who also attended the site visit this morning. The application before you follows a detailed pre-application inquiry submitted to officers for their consideration. The application seeks permission for the change of use of land for 71 caravans and associated works, including the improved access at High Farm Country Park. High Farm is an established high quality holiday park and benefits from a recently constructed office, reception and cafe. There is also a children's play area, 
fishing lakes and nine-hole golf course on site. The park has a mixture of accommodation available, including touring caravans, static caravans, camping pods and holiday cottages. The business is a family-owned and operated holiday park, with family living on site in the original farmhouse, who ensure the park is carefully managed. High Farm currently provides employment for a healthy number of local people, totaling 26 full-time staff. This includes cleaners, ground staff and office staff. Seven jobs have been created through the new cafe facility on site. And in addition, there are self-employed people in the area who rely on work from High Farm. The Holiday Park plays a wider economic role in the local community by utilising local trades. The recent building constructed on site employed many local trades. Building materials are sourced from Brands Burton. The electrician lives in Sigglesthorne. The plumber is from North Frodingham. The builder from Hull. Timber from Turner Timbers. Groundworks from Oldborough. Roofers from Bridlington. And the joiner is from Preston. The application before you today proposes to expand the park and provide significant improvements to the existing highway entrance. There are no objections from land drainage, the Lead Local Flood Authority, Yorkshire Water, the IDB, the Environment Agency, following the submission of a detailed drainage report. Nature Conservation raised no objection to the submitted ecology report. Humber Archaeology have been consulted and following geophysical surveys raised no objection. Environmental Control have recommended a condition which is accepted and raise no objection. Ticton and Ralph Parish Council and Leven Parish Council have objected. However, officers have addressed the concerns raised in detail in their report. Warren Parish Council, however, would like to approve the application and Riston submitted no comments. A transport statement has been completed and Highway Control's response, detailed on page 88 of the report, raises no objection and is considered robust. Highway state that the proposed alterations to the existing access would improve internal traffic, which subsequently could have a positive effect on traffic entering the site, potentially reducing the need for queuing further. Highway officers identify that the improvements, including the introduction of a split exit lane and widening for the first 27 metres, will address the priority of access and exit needed to cyclists and pedestrians and would improve accessibility to local amenities and alternative modes of transport. In addition, the construction management plan submitted is also considered acceptable. Following discussions with officers, an additional landscaping scheme has been submitted to seek to address concerns raised by one resident. Officers conclude that the proposal in terms of neighbour amenity remains acceptable. We also propose to remove the existing dog walk from the neighbour's boundary. The application is supported by a number of local businesses, including the Nags Head Pub and one of the cottages. Your officer report concludes that the proposal is supported with the local plan and national plan policies, which recognise tourism as a key employment sector in the East Riding. We respectfully request members support this existing high quality tourism business and their officer recommendation of approval, please. Thank you, Miss Edwardson. I'll now open the floor to members for the debate and have Councillor Wilkinson wishing to come in first. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that my questions are already being answered by Chief Luke just after I put my hand up. Um, I, I think this is a, 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 an exceptionally good application um, with um, uh, local businesses benefiting completely from this in line with what we have been trying to do. Um, within the East Riding to support small businesses and, and local businesses. I, I, however, we, we also have to look at the fact of the impact on, on the neighbours and um, the objector was, um, had a reasonable view that his, uh, he was having issues with that particular path. However, <laughs> as soon as I put my hand up, the, uh, 
that they mentioned they were going to remove the uh, the dog walk, which would have co- which is causing the issue to the objector, um, w- which obviously um, is the one I was going to suggest. Is there a possibility of changing the route or a possibility of liaising with the objector to, to get a, a block fence to to protect the dogs? Therefore, they wouldn't cause a problem. But if they're going to remove the dog walk or change it, uh, then that's a mute point, and uh, and I would therefore propose. Um, uh, approval um, of this in line with the officer's recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I noticed we've had a, uh, within the updates uh, prickly planting, defensive planting along the um, the boundaries added. Um, I, my my main concern on this application is the impact on those neighbours. And when I looked on the, uh, when I went to the site, I saw that although there is planting that has gone in, it's going to take a while to mature. And so some uh, some fast growing prickly things, I think, will be excellent in keeping people away from that boundary. Um, I'm very aware that when you've got shrubbery, small children like to hide in it to play whatever games. And um, so having... Uh, Having defensive planting would encourage them to find some softer shrubbery to play in rather than being next to someone's houses with their with their various noises and uh, things that could be disturbing. Um, there is um, something that I've picked up on, though, and that is the um, the septic tank and drainage of the neighbour. I suspect most of that will be a civil issue. But I'm also concerned that what we've heard today about um, the septic tank being one that drains into, into the land, being quite a historic type. And I believe that is now outlawed. So on a change of ownership of the house, it would have to be renewed anyway. Um, the caravan park itself is connected to mains drainage. I'm wondering if we could put in a benefit for this neighbour Um, as part of the application. I don't know if it can be conditioned, but perhaps on a gentleman's agreement that we could ask maybe to defer um, for officers to to do negotiation before um, any approval is given, that that the applicant arrange for for this to be a connection to the, the main sewer, which I think given all the work that's going on here with all these caravans being connected to sewage would be quite minor. Let's ask the officers if we're within our powers to request that. Thank you, Councillor. Um, it would certainly be a benefit, obviously, to the to the resident, I'm, I'm sure. Unfortunately, we can only condition things that are required as a result of the development, so impacts of the development. So we couldn't require it as a condition. Um, we could put an informative on and ask the question, obviously, before we um, issue the decision, certainly. Um, more than happy to do that, just to make the, you know, add that as an informative and, and, and make the applicant aware of that as a potential, something that could potentially benefit the um, the local resident. Um, we obviously have to make sure the resident would be happy with that as well. So it's, you know, um, so, yeah, we can definitely raise it and put it on as an informative. Right, that's what I was thinking. If I defer and delegate so you could have that bit of negotiation before anything goes in, in a formal decision. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not sure we'd need to necessarily defer and delegate. Obviously, it's up to members, but because it wouldn't necessarily be a negotiation that would be if they didn't agree to that, we wouldn't be issuing the decision because obviously we can't require it. But we can certainly, I can have a chat with the agent after the meeting um, and we can and definitely raise it. Obviously, the agent's here today. so um, and But it isn't something that I would say we need to necessarily negotiate as in, you know, hold up the application for that reason. Right. I'm just thinking that the, um, the objector also mentioned that there are sewage problems and raw sewage within that field when there are issues there, which could cause a public health issue problem that is on the application site so it, it's not just a secondary benefit it is it is actually linked to this application because we don't want to be approving holiday and children playing in areas where they're amongst raw sewage because of a, a neighboring drainage issue so would you like to add an informative council maths in that that 
the applicant looks to address the neighbour's um, soak away issue if possible. That's right, yes. And then um, because of the impact on this site, uh, to, to get a mutual benefit out of that in what is effectively a small addition to this development. To clarify, though, from offices, that's not been raised as a concern by our public um, protection team, has it? No, it's not been raised as a concern by any of our drainage consultees or our um, public protection. Obviously, the drainage arrangements that are proposed for the proposed development are considered acceptable by our technical consultees. Um, they won't have considered the existing septic tank from the neighbour, however, but um, because they're only considering the proposed development, obviously, if there is an issue there, then it is to a certain extent a civil matter. Um, but yeah, our technical consultees are happy. If there is an issue, it would be in the applicant's interest to address it, I believe. is what the point you're making, isn't it, Councillor Matheson? That's right. As well as the neighbour's um, interest. So, Councillor Wilkerson, are you happy to add that informative to your motion for approval? And then, Councillor Matheson, are you happy to second that motion with that informative added? Yes, with that informative added, um, I am happy to, to second. Thank you. Councillor Whittle, you're next on my list. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is not in my ward, but it is a join me ward. And obviously, I drive past it virtually every time I come into County Hall. Um, it's the first time, however, I've actually been on the site. And um, for those of the, those of you who know me, I'm not a great lover of caravan sites, particularly when they form a coastal strip. But this doesn't form a coastal strip. It appears to me to be a very pleasant environment for those people who wish to dwell in uh, such um such dwellings uh, my, my views on this however uh, are, are largely beneficial i think um there is a comment about uh you know if there isn't a need for it and all that well if there wasn't a need for statics to be built uh, then they wouldn't be building them in the first place and i'm going to give a bit of feedback on that which i suspect is coming from comes from um, is that better right um uh, I note uh, the response regarding uh, tree height and the fact we're going to be planting more mature trees um, in order to uh, exacerbate, to, to make the problems less for the, the neighbour. Um, I would inquire what the situation is regarding um, charging points. I, I assume there's going to be a charging point on each static, but I'd leave that to Matthew to answer. Uh, overall, however, Chair, um, Unusually for me, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to accept a caravan park. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Whistler. And just to clarify, these are not dwellings, they're a, a tourism facility, and there's conditions to make sure that they don't become any permanent dwellings, because that would be against our local plan. But I know what well, you well, meant. Well, I know what you meant. Just to come back to you on that, Chair, a dwelling is where people live, not necessarily all the time. So I think uh, I'll contend that point. Just, just to ask officers on your question about electric vehicle charging points, do we have the details of whether they're going to be put on the, on the site or not? Um, my understanding is that caravans are not, I, I, I think as um, through building regs, obviously dwellings are proposed, but obviously this is a holiday and they're temp, the caravans are technically temporary, temporary structures. So I don't think that they are required. Um, but of the site might choose to provide some at the reception area, um, but I don't think it's a requirement. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rudd. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I, I'm, I'm first of all uh, very pleased that uh, the, uh, the, the, the dog walking site is going to be removed uh, in the interest of the objector. And uh, I'm, I'm very much support the informative uh, regarding uh, regarding this, the uh, the drainage because I think that they, they they are two important points and I, I would hope that the the applicants do consider uh, this second one particularly seriously. Looking back in 2010, this this site started uh, uh, with, with the touring caravans and uh, obviously it's a, it's a very successful site hence. The, the application for 71 more caravans. I was very impressed when I went on the site visit, a very good site um, and, and some very good facilities there for, as, as far as caravan sites go. Um, 
I think there's there's so many pluses to this, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, the 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 the, the jobs, the tourism, the local tourism, the uh, help for the pub, help for the local businesses that are already um, uh, supplying um, various uh, uh, benefits for the park, and of course uh, these will continue um, uh, if if this application is passed. Um, I'm very pleased to see also the um, the extra screening. I think that's very important to to, to look after the interests of the uh, the, the existing residents that uh, are back onto the, that back onto this uh, site. It's a very large field, um, and, um, and 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 it makes good use of what is basically a, a, a field which naturally is part of 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 the actual uh, site, if you like. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to this, a lot of business benefits, a lot of tourism benefits. Um, and uh, being a tour tourism area, this can only enhance the tourists that actually come to the area, which can be good for everyone. So a lot of benefits to this. Um, and, uh, and also taking into account the objectors uh, that the two issues mentioned, um, I'm very, very happy to support this because it can only be benefit, benefit to the site and many, many people involved as well. Not only the people who want to stay there, but also the, the local businesses and so on. So very happy to support it, Jim. Thank you, Councillor Rudd. Councillor McMaster. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I like to listen to everybody before I comment. The, the downside to that is that by the time it comes to my turn, everything's been cool. said. But at the risk of repeating everything, everything everybody said, I think this is an excellent applic application. Great sympathy for the objector. Um, I hear what he says about the objector says about dogs. I'm pleased that the footpath has been removed. That will mitigate noise. The soak away, I have a bigger reservation. If it's soaking away into another neighboring private property, there's something wrong and it shouldn't be. So that needs to be addressed and I'm less sympathetic, but I'm happy for the proposal to, for the two parties to get together and see if something amicable can be arranged. And in terms of visual impairment, I think I'm very happy that the landscaping proposed um, is suffice to create a visual and sound barrier between the proposed caravans and the closest um, existing dwelling so all in all i think efforts have been made to take into consideration neighboring um views and i'm happy to support this application thank you thank you councillor west it's unfortunate you've not listened to me i've got to go now um just uh page 106 paragraph 18 it refers to um lighting um, no external lighting shall be installed on the site other than indicated on the approved site plan. Um, LAR it ends in 101, which is in our pack from what I can see, but it's quite small detail with it being on A4. Um, what sort of lighting is this? And is it something that the uh, objector uh, highlighted that we could um, reduce or make less of an impact on people? Is it? Is it... I mean, I'm not assuming it's uh, the height or something you get on a motorway. Ms. Waldell, can you clarify the lighting proposed? Yeah. Yes, the, land, the lighting has been now moved on to the new site plan, which is here. It's basically, it's all it is is low-level bollard lighting. So it's these yellow dots that you very faintly see on there, but um, just low-level bollard lighting. That are one meter high. Thank you. That seems fairly unintrusive. Thank you, Councillor West. Councillor Healy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it was the first time I'd been there today. Um, I was impressed with the the, the overall site, um, the way it's laid out, the way it appears to be managed. Um, hearing the agents say family business, um, people living on site to make sure that things work well. Um, and that field in itself um, clearly is an empty field and I can understand the need uh, for development or the requirement for the owners to want to see some development. 
Um, Routh is a fairly small place. It's, it's just a, a, a few hamlet. It's a small hamlet. There are few houses. You blink and you'll miss it. Um, and I think for any business to be able to get people to come on holiday to such a place is a, is a great achievement, really, to turn that uh, location into um, a tourist um, destination um, for people to enjoy this magnificent ease riding in Beverly just on the doorstep and the coast not very far away is is a is an achievement and clearly because the business wants to expand the owners clearly think there is um, an opportunity for that however um, uh, the agent also said that the uh, concerns of the parish councils have been listened to and um, I just really wanted to just make sure that they had so looking at, um, at what's said now clearly one of the things that is mentioned is the cesspit arrangements as they call it for the four adjacent cottages we have had this informative i did think it was a, a good suggestion from councillor matheson um to sort of explore this idea of can can they do something for this uh, resident in terms of getting him connected to the main sewerage or whatever um and i think i'd like to think that the nature of the applicants is such that they would want to reach out and, and, and build goodwill and may consider such an arrangement. Obviously, we can do no more than an informative, um, but I'd like to encourage that if it can happen. Um, and then on the other issue uh, was traffic, and, and um, uh, we've seen the proposal from highways for the redesign of the entrance um, and the, uh, the, the, the lane um, markings that's been proposed for both right and left turns. I think, I think that's sensible. It is, it is actually a difficult turn off. I mean, you, you know, you, anybody turning right onto a 50 mile an hour road has to take a lot of care. Um, we can't stop people doing that. A lot of 50 mile an hour roads on the east riding. But I think that the, the proposal to change the lane configurations there to make it more um, clear uh, is a good thing. Um, so, with that, yes, I, I I will be supporting this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Uh, Mr. Forces, the Highways Officer, did you want to comment on the highways proposals whilst they've been mentioned? Because I think they are a key concern of some locals. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're um, very happy with the the highway proposals. The uh, like Councillor Healy said it does um, does include a, a right and left turn out of the site. Obviously, um, priorities along the 1035 and, and people uh, motorists leaving the site do have to leave uh, with, with due care and attention. Um, there's no accident um, statistics along this particular section of, of the 1035 at the junction. The nearest one um, to the east was a kilometre away and to the west it was um, 370 metres away. So there's actually no accident um, statistics at this junction whatsoever. So from a highway point of view, we're very happy with the access improvements and the access road improvements as well. Thank you. Do any of the members wish to speak on this application? No, well, just just down to me then. I think, as members will know, I'm very keen on on site visits because I often find that plans uh, can be slightly misleading one way or another. And I think in this case, the plans actually didn't do uh, the proposals as much justice as, as they could have done, actually, when compared to seeing it on site. The caravans on the plans look far closer to the neighbouring properties than they are on, on site and in, in real life. I also noticed, interestingly, on the site visit that the two neighbouring properties closest to the access don't really have any screening currently from the um, obviously entrance to the park and golf course behind them. So I think the landscaping proposed as part of this application, which I'm glad to see has now been upgraded, reinforced, and we've been given a detailed uh, list of species and sizes, et cetera, will actually benefit those properties uh, and, and help them protect their residential means even more than, than they can do at the moment. So I'm, I'm more than happy to support the application. The business looks to be a really good local business contributing to our local economy. I uh, absolutely hear the residents' concerns about the Sokoway issue. Obviously, it is a civil matter, which we as a planning committee cannot control. But I think with Councillor Matheson's informative, we've, we've expressed a clear view that we'd like to see efforts made for the advantage of both uh, parties to address that situation and finally as well as other members have said i'm glad to see the dog dog path has been moved away from those uh local properties to, to stop any issues relating um into inter neighbor relations going on with that so I'm, I'm happy to support the application in line with the motion that we have on the table which is 
A proposal from Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by Councillor Matheson, to approve the application in line with the variations and updates to conditions expressed by uh, Miss Weldale in her update and the additional informative to seek a solution to the SOCO issue for the neighbouring property. Is that correct? All those in favour of that motion, please raise your hands. That's everyone, Chairman. That's therefore carried unanimously, and the application is improved, as I've just uh, approved, <laughs> as I've just outlined. That's all our applications for today. Uh, we'll now move on to item seven, which is the list of future planning applications, pages 119 to 122 of our packs. Uh, you'll see, members, that we've got quite a lot of applications listed and ready to come before committee shortly. Most of them actually are already noted for, for site visits, but there are a couple which aren't. Do members want to ask for site visits on any of the ones which are not? Councillor Wilkinson. Howden, please. The Howden, Howden, the last one, yeah, which yeah. is the relief road and, uh, and and subsequent. I think that's quite important because it's a, a massive one, and I think it's good that we look at what's happening there. Yeah, I would agree. I think obviously that's a major allocation in the upcoming local plan and a major application in itself. So I'm happy if members are to have a site visit for that site. I'd also like to propose, actually, if members again are happy that we have a pre-committee presentation for that application because it is so big. I think. Uh, members of the public, whether they're for or against, and obviously the applicant can need more time to express their views uh, on, on that detailed application. Are members happy with that? Thank you. I'll leave that with officers to arrange. Councillor Healy? Yeah, the one at uh, Bridlington, um, I only mention this because it seems to keep coming back to this committee time and time again. Um, so simply because it does, and I don't think you, you may have already done a site visit there. Um, I, I wasn't on it because I wasn't on the committee, I don't think, but uh, I, I would find it useful to see what this is all about, but uh, the application. If, you've already, if you've already done it, then you might not want to. Uh, yeah, the application at Flamborough, do you mean, Councillor? Yeah, yeah Flamborough, I beg your pardon, yeah. Uh, we did have a site visit for that a while ago, uh, but do members it. want to have another site visit for that If you've already area? seen it, I don't mind going. If not, then obviously members have a right to yeah. go and look up at the site as individuals as well. Yeah, okay. I think that's what members are wanting to do we don't want a site visit for that site because we've already been no, officially I'm as a to go and, uh, have a look at it i missed out on it you see so oh, well you you've joined you've joined the great committee now council healy so uh council mcmaster yeah thank you chair this is this the one if i remember rightly that we rejected because they in my my words nobody else's but blatantly went ahead and built it higher than they should have and different colors to what they should have and Yes, Council okay. Master, I believe so, but I'll bring in Mr Hunt to clarify. Yes, I, th I think this site may have been to committee three times previously, so this is for fourth time lucky, but there are a number of plots adjacent to um, the boundary that cause concern amongst officers and members in terms of the height. Um, the applicant has come in, made some amendments, brought down or proposing to bring down the building house um, of, the build of the houses that have actually already been constructed. Um, so this is an application to try and uh, rectify the issues that members, the concern that members raised last, last summer time. So members will be able to look at it again on its merits uh, when it comes to committee. Again, Chair, given that, and again, this is my words, given that this applicant was given permission to do one thing and blatantly did something different, he's now stating he's rectified that. Given the history, I would say I want to see the difference. I want to personally see the difference. So I would support another site visit, despite the fact that we've had a couple. So I think, um, oh, did you want to come in, Mr. Hunt? Yeah, did you, just to cl clarify, Chair, the, 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 the developer has not lowered the houses yet. This is just what the developer is proposing to do. So a site visit, you would only see what you saw when you went on site in the summertime. Okay, in that case, there's no point. I think it would be useful, though, when that does come back to committee, yes. where we have clear plans showing what what has been built, what was supposed to be built, and what is now being proposed, if that's different to the original permission. So members can get that clear in their head, because it was confusing previously. Um, Councillor Whittle. Yes, Chair, just to back up, uh, Councillor McMaster, on that. I believe on the previous site visit, there was only they and me. Yes, me and you attended and, and, and looked around the site. I think other members have attended on their own, uh, individually. I think I think a lot of members have been to the site on one of the times it's come to committee, but obviously we'll we'll look at it when it comes as an application before us at committee as we do with all of them and judge it on its 
on its merits. Um, Councillor Davison. Yes, um, just a question of trans waste. Um, I'm just wondering whether um, if there is, if there could be an early um, uh, site visit post May. In other words, if this isn't going to be considered until after May, and we get a new planning committee, I'm sure trans waste are not going to go away, and uh, they could, they could. Uh, um, yeah, good. The yeah. transverse applications, I'm just told, are definitely coming to our next meeting, so that'll be before the election. So we will be going for a site visit, and then we will be looking at all those, I believe, 13 applications. So you've not all escaped from it yet. I, I just wondered whether this these particular applications justify the site visit or whether it's just the hours of working which are... Members would like to, I think, because there's so many applications and so many changes proposed, members decided a while ago that we'd like to have a site visit for this uh, group of applications to see the site, what's proposed to change, etc. So we will have that when it comes to committee at the end of this month. Any other comments for members on future applications? No. In which case, then we'll go to item eight, which is any urgent matters I wish to raise. I have none. So thank you all for attending and for the good debates you've had today. I will see you at